Hello, everyone, and welcome to this discussion. Thank you all so much for joining us. I feel very honored and privileged to have such a fabulous group of people speaking at this event and uh, to be discussing this book that we produced, uh, which came out in February this year on the nature of formalization. Just to give you a little introduction about why we did this. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a no brainer, right? That it's much better to be in formal work. And we have seen this during the pandemic uh, especially when the wave that spread over the global economy destroyed informal workers much more than others with no legal and social protection and women particularly were the most adversely affected. And so, you know, when you talk about formalization policies for women workers, it seems so obvious that it is going to be beneficial and wonderful and necessary. What we looked at was how exactly these formalization policies work out in some developing countries. And there were five countries that we uh, looked at for the study. We looked at South Africa, Ghana, Morocco, Thailand, and India. And the idea was really to see how these work and whether they are done with any kind of gender lens and what that really means for informal women workers. So we're going to actually have a, a quick uh, overview of the main results of the studies just now. I just want to first of all begin by thanking Open Society Foundations, which very generously funded this study, and particularly Sarah Hewitt, who's been an immense pillar of support throughout all this time. And if I could very quickly give you some of the main results, I think the, the essential point is that good intentions and goals are not enough. And what we've seen in this case particularly is that if the policies don't recognize the specific conditions of informal work and particularly for women workers that they can often be not just not helpful but even counterproductive and we found that there's a very big difference between attempts to formalize enterprises rather than formalizing employment and when you try to formalize enterprises especially the micro enterprises it often ends up damaging women workers in particular ways and that's because women already begin disadvantaged in many ways. As self-employed, they lack assets, they lack titles to property, access to credit. They don't get into government programs or have access to inputs. It's also very hard to deal with patriarchal officialdom as a woman micro-entrepreneur. There are many social restrictions on mobility and on the kinds of activities you can do. And these, of course, also extend to women who are as wage workers in informal activities. They generally face much worse uh, labor market conditions than men, lower wa wages, longer and more irregular hours, workplace harassment in different ways, and of course the need to do unpaid labor at home. And the fact that many of them have less education and therefore are less able to do the kinds of bargaining that are required. We're going to get into the uh, case studies very quickly and just to give you an idea how this will go, we'll have very quick descriptions of the case studies. And then I'm going to hand it over to our very distinguished panel, whom we're absolutely honored to have with us, Marty Chen, Diane Elson, and Pasuk Pompaichit. And then we will have some time for questions. Please put your questions into the chat or the Q&A, and we will try and call on you to speak. And if we have too many, then we will just try and bring them all together. But please do keep putting your questions into the Q&A and the chat. With that, I'm going to request Hamida Didat, who is in Naledi, the research wing of the Gosatu, the trade union group in South Africa. Uh, she's going to tell us about the South African experience. Hamida, please. Thank you very much, Jayaji, and thank you so much for allowing me to, to have the privilege to be part of such an esteemed um, panel. Good afternoon to everybody. It's afternoon on this side of the world. Um, so, look, I mean, the five minutes, it's a, it was a really intense uh, case study, so I'm basically just going to scheme and hopefully whet your appetite so that you can actually go and read the chapter. So I think the, the key thing when one talks about formalization of the informal economy, we know that when you sit within a patriarchal system, if it's going to be gendered, um, one would want to see formalization or implementations of formalization that actually starts ch um, challenging the patriarchal system. Unfortunately, I think throughout the case studies and also particularly in the case of South Africa, we saw that the patriarchal system is actually entrenched through formalization. Um, the South African case study 
focuses by and large on recommendations to enforce. So we know the ILO conventions normally dictate how you do, uh, how you regulate the, the formal work economy. Through certain uh, civil society processes, and I think Pat Horn, we go, and the relationship with labor, plus community, and Ned, at NEDLAC in particular, they managed to facilitate a process where you had informal economy uh, organizations representing the informal economy workers actually go and negotiate quite substantively recommendation to a fall. And again, you know, noting who Pat Horn is, noting who we go is with really strong feminist, you know, on, on the project, uh, sorry, on, the, on these programs, it was a really strong effort to actually bring in key issues that confront work, work, workers in the informal economy. So if you take informal traders, for an example, formalization for, for a municipality would mean relocating um, informal traders who are maybe sporadically dispersed to a more formalized space, um, um, but forgetting that you need to ensure that they're within close proximity of taxis, you need to make sure that they're within close proximity of toilets, you need to make sure that they have hand washing facilities, and that if it is that they need to do their social reproductive work, you shouldn't be cutting them off by leaving them in an isolated place. So in many instances, what formalization in the South African context meant was we'd like to register you, we'd like to know how many workers are in their formal economy, we'd like to try and see if we can actually accrue some form of tax from you. Um, you know, so that was, that, that's been the, the, the major gist um, of formalization. Just to enter one was one a key case study that that had a particularly interesting uh, dynamic, and I'm, I'm hoping you're going to read it, is the work around um, informal miners, uh, informal women miners who actually, again, when challenging the whole issue of patriarchy, um, form, uh, formally engage in transactional sex and and use that as a way of actually getting access to tools, to housing, to food, and then hopefully being able to access um, you know the raw diamonds and then access to um, someone who'd be able to sell the diamond for them at a much, at a relatively better price than they would if they were not engaging in these kinds of processes. So I mean, clearly, and I think Jet has um, highlighted some of the key, you know, findings of the paper, but ultimately, good intentions in terms of what formalization is, is about, but I think COVID-19 has definitely exposed that workers in the informal economy, despite the attempts at formalization, were way worse off um, than workers in the, in, the informal economy, in the formalized economy. Thank you. Wow, Hamida, you know, that is such a rich case study in South Africa. And there's so many interesting examples of the mine workers she's mentioned, of domestic workers and street traders and others. I'm amazed that you managed to summarize this so quickly and beautifully. Uh, Thank you. And in, <laughs> in such a rapid way. I'm going to unfortunately have to summarize the Ghana case study because Joji Tsikata uh, and Promise Iwe, who have done the case study, are unable to join us. Joji had an urgent uh, faculty appointment meeting that she had to attend. So just, just to quickly highlight the main results of Ghana, you know, it's another interesting study because it has high employment rates, very, very high rates of uh, working age people being employed, 90% and so on, but also very high informality. 90% of workers are informal, more than half of all the informal workers are women. Uh, so what they did in Ghana is that they looked at two specific case studies to see how the formalization policies had worked out. One was contract farming and the other was domestic trade. And what they found in contract farming, which is when you allow companies to come in and get into contracts with the farmers, it's supposed to actually provide some degree of formal relationship that will enable better conditions for the farmers. They really found that it was amounting to what they have called false formalization, whereby informal activities get subsumed into by the formal companies. And the formal work the, in the agricultural workers themselves do not experience better conditions by any means. They found that uh, nearly half of them were still poor, I think around 43% of them. No, more than 90% of them had no medical care, no social security, or no other benefits that could come from associating with the companies. And they also found that they didn't necessarily get a reduction in the risk associated with production. If anything, it increased because of the tendency of the companies to pass down global prices which were lower or to damn, claim that a lot of the crop was not of sufficient quality and therefore would get a lower price. In the case of domestic retail trade, I think the real issue was exactly what Hamida has highlighted, the absence of any kind of gender sensitivity, even in terms of local government control over public spaces and infrastructure. A lot of demolition of structures, harassment of street traders and all of that in the name of formalization. 
but very little in the terms of the provision of amenities and basic services that would enable them to function properly. So what they found was that regulation doesn't really improve the conditions of workers or lead to decent work. It's a very short summary for again, what is a very, very fascinating case study. And I think an unusual example of the contract agriculture, but I'm going to have to leave that there and we will move on to the case of Thailand. So Jessica, if you... Um, thank you, Jayati, and, um, and thank you for the invitation to, um, to speak uh, this evening. And uh, I, this was just a really wonderful project. That I had a great experience working on it, so I was very happy to be able to be a, a part of it. This is a very uh, quick overview of the Thailand study. Um, and just in terms of the uh, background of Thailand's economy, there was a lot of structural change in the economy since the 1970s. And there was a transformation from a primarily agricultural economy to a more of a manufacturing and service-based economy. At the same time, we saw very rapid expansion of compulsory and free education, as well as higher education. And so today, we have a fairly highly educated um, workforce and a fairly um, service-heavy um, and manufacturing-heavy um, um, economy. Um, unemployment rates over the last decade have hovered around 1% and so are extremely low, um, which is just kind of an interesting fact of the uh, Thai economy, um, which actually has to do with the informality of the economy. Um, but the interesting thing is, despite the structural change and despite the um, uh, you know, growth in educated uh, workforce, Thailand remains a largely informal um, labor market. Um, in, informal workers are defined by not having employer provided social security um, or other social protections. And under this definition, um, <clears throat> greater than 55% of Thai workers are considered informally employed and that number actually may be quite a bit higher. Um, interestingly, if you look at like the average wages of informal workers, um, they do make on average higher than the, um, the minimum wage um, here in Thailand. So. Um, Informal work does not necessarily mean um, extremely poorly paid work. In fact, a lot of it is actually uh, fairly well paid. Um, if you are informally employed and don't have access to employer provided social protection, uh, the Thai government actually provides quite a bit of uh, social protection um, universally. So for example, the universal healthcare um, system um, is, is very uh, comprehensive and um, is actually quite uh, well known and is often used as a model for other developing countries. Uh, we also have a uh, universal non-contributory uh, old age pension uh, for older um, uh, individuals uh, 60 and above. Uh, we have a poor card, which uh, provides um, some um, relief to some people as well as uh, free education up to age 17. And we also have an optional social security um, that provides um, pension, invalidity, death, and um, child um, payments. Uh, for the case studies, uh, we had three case studies uh, for our portion. We uh, looked at domestic workers, sex work, and manufacturing. I'll say just a few words about the domestic work uh, case study because that's the one I worked on um, most heavily. And um, what we find is that there is a, a mix of formal and informal workers uh, within domestic work, kind of depending on what um, the environment is. If it's um, in the home, about 90% are informal, but if it's in uh, like cleaning offices or hotels and so on, um, only 20% is actually informal. If we compare across um, formal and informal workers um, uh, working in homes and um, hotels, we actually find there's not huge differentials in terms of the hours worked and uh, monthly labor income, as well as hourly wages. So it's you know slightly lower for informal workers, but not like hugely um, lower. And we also find in all cases that um, most people are making well above the uh, minimum wage. Um, we also did some interviews um, across uh, women who are working formally and informally in domestic work and cleaning services and um, had some very interesting um, conversations with the women. Um, and one of the things we asked is, you know, why do you choose to work in, informally and would you work formally if you had the option? And the majority of women said, no, we actually would, we actually prefer to work informally. And um, some of the reasons given is because even though the work hours might be a little bit longer than formal work, employers tend to provide more flexibility to take care of personal business. To, and they also actually had better annual leave and sick leave than the formal workers that we had interviewed, which was really 
interesting. Um, the tasks are easier and there's less pressure um, in the informal setting um, was something that came up a lot. Also, um, interestingly, access to informal credit through employers was also a really important thing um, in a, an economy where um, not everybody has um, access to um, formal financial um, institutions. Also, uh, for those who are live-in workers, uh, they preferred informality because they also had no transportation or living costs because they, that was provided by um, their workplace. Um, in manufacturing, we actually found a lot of kind of the same things, the reasons why people chose to work informally when we actually have a huge demand. I remember I said that unemployment rate was 1%. We have a huge demand for formal workers, but people, a lot of people choose not to work formally. And so a lot of those um, reasons uh, kind of uh, were the same. So in terms of um, sort of the whole study, um, our conclusions were that um, Thailand has high demand for female workers in a lot of the lower skilled uh, work in the, uh, in the formal sector, but many do choose to work um, informally because of the flexibility, especially especially to tackle uh, financial, I'm sorry, family responsibilities. Uh, there's often a lot less pressure at the workplace. Um, there's a social networks that develop in these informal um, workplaces. And they already have a lot of access to social protection from some of the universal programs. And so they don't need that to be provided by um, the workplace. Um, and blanket formalization policies we uh, determined might not be suitable because they don't take into consideration preferences for informal working environments um, that are more compatible with caring roles that are usually taken on by women. And for the sex industry in particular, social stigma might actually drive some activities even further underground if it's legalized. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jessica. In fact, you know, her last point about the sex industry, there's a really interesting discussion there on, on the, the, the nature of the sex workers and their difficulties with formal processes. Okay, uh, next we're going to have uh, India uh, with Chandru, CP Chandrasekhar talking about our, our case study there. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Well, this was a study which was done with uh, Jyoti and two younger colleagues, uh, Shreya Sharma and Nancy Yadav. And um, uh, there's a lot of similarity, of course, uh, across countries um, with some differences. So I just thought I'll, I'll point to two or three uh, elements of the Indian uh, case which uh, uh, were striking. First, of course, is was the you know the degree to which informality gets embedded in the non-agricultural economy. By embedded, I mean, you know, whether you take uh, a static view, that is, you take a point of time picture, you actually find that even if you have definitions of informality, uh, or formality, which are, which are, which are quite uh, sort of uh, lenient, if you want to say, or relaxed, uh, in terms of uh, whether there's a written contract, whether there's paid leave, whether there's any social security benefit, etc. If at least one of these things are there, you consider the worker to be a formal worker, even if you take a definition which is... Uh, as limited as that, you actually find that uh, both in terms of uh, our own survey, but also in terms of the, the sort of larger surveys conducted by the National uh, Sample Survey Organization, you find an extremely high degree of uh, informality. Uh, the formal workforce is, you know, something like seven percent or, 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 or of, the, of the total workforce outside, in particular outside, you know, I mean, I mean of, of the economy as a whole. But the second thing is that you find uh, a high degree of informality of work within the formal sector as well. You find not merely casual workers, but even within the public sector, you actually find that there is a significant employment of workers on an informal basis. And of course, there are some really sort of odd cases like um, um, the ASHA workers who are accredited social activists who are paid an honorarium and not really paid a wage. And that honorarium, which you know, varies between, depending upon the level of the worker, between let's say $25 and maybe going up to $40, essentially means that most of them, uh, almost all of them are below the minimum wage, the nationally specified minimum wage. So even in the public sector, and that of course is, uh, is, is an extreme example, but there are, there are lots more in terms of uh, just casual, casualty, casual work in, in, in the formal sector. Uh, but even in a dynamic sense, this embedded nature of informality emerges. And, by a dynamic sense is that you know you find workers moving in and out of formal or let's say regular and ostensibly identified as formal because it's the formal work 
well, it's the formal sector, even though the worker is not a formal worker, but you find the worker moving into the formal sector, then losing a job, and then coming into the informal sector. And of course, you know, you know moving around even within the informal sector in, 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 in substantial measure. Uh, and some of them can, you know, go to sort of peculiar, you know, extents. There's a, there was a, uh, a worker in a, in a, in a sort of um, branded mall who actually had uh, jobs with different bands and the kind of uh, salary you get and the benefits you get would depend upon which brand you're working with in this particular week or this particular month. So you have this sort of mobility across formal and informal and within the informal sector, which, which actually even in dynamic sense, says, you know, says that, I mean, there is no line di di dividing formality and informality. Informality is embedded deeply within, within the non-agricultural economy. Now, the thing is, if you look at state action on the other hand, uh, rather than dealing with the problem of the informal worker, of trying to actually move the informal worker into a formal situation and therefore give them, give them the benefits of what a formal worker is supposed to get, what you actually have is a tendency to try and outside of, of the production space, outside of the workplace, you set up schemes to give some social protection to informal workers. So you give some of them uh, some kind of an old age pension possibility, you give some of them a little bit of access to healthcare, but all of these are government schemes, which you can register if you're part of the targeted population meant for these schemes. It's really not tied into the workplace and the employer. That's, you're not trying to formalize the worker, but what you do find in India in particular is that even in terms of macroeconomic policy, the attempt is to formalize the enterprise, to formalize the organization. And two sort of, you know, sort of extreme steps which are taken in which part of the defense was that this would help formalize uh, uh, enterprises and, 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 and firms was uh, one of course was demonetization where you all of a sudden one evening declared that uh, you know, currency notes are 500 rupees and above and 500 rupees is, uh, uh, you know, is not even uh, $10. Uh, so you basically say that all of those notes are no more legal tender. And this actually means you have a huge cash crunch in the economy. Much of the informal sector works with cash and therefore this results in a situation where, where you, 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 uh, you have uh, informal workers losing out. Or you have the goods and services tax, which is a value added tax, which is trying to bring people into uh, 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 a declared, into a declared, uh, I mean, it's a, a system where they'll have to declare their transactions. And if they have to declare their transactions, you can bring them into the tax net. So the whole idea is you want to formalize the enterprises, which very often mean that these enterprises actually disappear, are not able to sustain themselves, uh, lose out, and you really don't achieve the larger goal of, of, of actually making an informal worker into a formal worker. So you, you have this disconnect in some sense between the nature of the informal formal sort of uh, uh, interaction, the absence of, uh, of actually a dividing line, the fact that informality is deeply embedded in terms of the workforce, but you have state policy, which essentially is geared to trying to do something at the margins in terms of providing so-called benefits, which formal workers would get through government schemes, but really, concentrate not on formalizing the workforce, but on formalizing enterprises. I just thought I'll just underline these two things. Yes. Thank, thanks so much, Chandru, uh, for highlighting some of those important aspects. I'm going to unfortunately also have to summarize the Morocco case study because Mona Cherkawi, who was involved with that, is also unable to join us. Uh, Morocco is also, it's interesting, like India, in fact, it has a very low women's workforce participation rate. Actually, India has fallen even more sharply in the recent past, but Morocco has, a, like much of the Middle East and North Africa, has low women's workforce participation, around 21% compared to 65% for men, with very high informality. Um, less than a quarter have any kind of medical coverage, less than 10% have any kind of other, you know, social security pensions and so on. Rural women workers are almost all informal. And of course, the role that they play, they play in agriculture is not just informal, but typically unrecognized, even though they are very active in agriculture. We all know this, they're often not even recognized as workers and therefore do not get many of the benefits that would accrue otherwise to farmers. Uh, there have been in Morocco, a bunch of active labor market policies. 
which are designed to generate formality by encouraging, you know, the kinds of things which are very attractive nowadays, startups and new kinds of activities in the service sector and so on. And there have been those that are specifically designed for women. Uh, the study finds that there's relatively less impact of all of these, not only because they're so limited in size and scope, but because they are operating in a much larger labor market context in which there are great difficulties in the participation of women. And these individual strategies are simply inadequate to uh, overcome them. The other thing that the study uh, looks at, it's quite an interesting study on domestic workers. Again, there was a law on domestic workers, which was based largely on the ILO convention and subsequently developed into what everyone would see as a progressive law. But once again, what's interesting in this is that uh, similar to what Jessica was saying, hardly anyone has registered for this law. And this is not just because employers don't want to for obvious reasons, but also because even the workers themselves are sometimes anxious about whether you know, the law would be binding them into a contract necessarily on a permanent basis. And also because the law doesn't recognize the different kinds of domestic worker that exist. Uh, they identify at least four different types, some of whom are extended family and who have other different kinds of links. The law is simply looking at it as a pure transactional relationship. And because it does not take into account all these differences, it hasn't turned out to be very relevant for domestic workers in Morocco. So these are, as you can see, these are very, very rich case studies and we've really not been able to do much justice to them in the last, uh, in, in the few minutes that uh, has been given to everyone. But I think just if I could have summarized some of the main results of all of them, obviously the macroeconomic context is crucial. And we see that, you know, conditions where there's a relatively better labor market situation, tighter employment, et cetera, that it's easier for even informal workers to get better conditions in situations of great slackness like India, where there's massive unemployment and declining employment rates. It's much worse even for formal workers to be able to get their minimum conditions, but informal workers obviously have an even worse time and women in particular. Um, the problem of false formalization, where certain things are recognized as creating formality, whereas in fact they do not provide any of the legal and social protections that we would expect, is a very major one that is spread across several of these case studies. The fact that formalizing enterprises can often work against women came out again and again in many of these case studies. Uh, there's also a very interesting study of uh, sanitation and recycling workers in South Africa that Hamida could have uh, you know, has, has also discussed in her paper. The fact that a lot of the regulation can be oppressive or even punitive for women, not just because they are gender insensitive, but because they're very rigid and they don't allow for particular so changing social contexts and fl flexibilities. We found in India that even some very well-meaning things like well, maternity benefits for informal workers have operated against women because employers are now less willing to hire them saying, well, we'll have to give you maternity benefit. And there's no, uh, the absence of regulation in India is well known. So, you know, the absence of implementation has, uh, has also become evident here. I think finally two things came out very starkly from all of the studies. One is the huge significance of universal social protection. I mean, Thailand shows how, you know, you, if you provide that, it, it makes such a massive difference to the overall condition of workers. Good quality universal social protection. And the other thing is the importance of mobilization and association. It came out very strongly in South Africa, but I think also in India that where women are enabled to get together, to associate, to mobilize, it makes some difference to their conditions as well. So very briefly, this was uh, some of the account of the, the book that uh, I hope many of you will actually go out and buy and read. And I'm absolutely delighted that we have, I think, what is possibly the, the ideal panel to discuss uh, this and all the issues that come out of this. I will introduce each of them. I tell, I, none of them needs introduction, but I will just introduce each of them as, uh, as they begin. And first we have Marty Chen, uh, who probably knows more about informality than anyone on the planet, and particularly informality of women workers. And um, Marty has done so much work 
on the nature of informality, the processes of formalization, the processes of informalization, and the varying conditions. I very strongly recommend a recent volume that she and Francoise Carré have brought out, which is the absolute go-to book for anybody who wants to know about informality. And so we're really very, very privileged to have Marty begin the discussion. So please, Marty, go ahead. Marty, you have to unmute. Thank you, Jayati, for those kind words, and more importantly, for inviting me to um, be a discussant. It's really a pleasure, and um, it is a topic, as you say, near and dear to my heart and to my mind. Um, and I just wanted to say that having worked on this topic for two, well, my whole career, <laughs> I hate to say how long that is, um, I see a tension that we've been able to um, get a lot of rethinking on formalization with the ILO and with other partners that it needs to be broader. It needs to look at informal employment, like you say, as well as informal enterprises, that it needs to have multiple dimensions. It's not just a one-time procedure of registering an enterprise. It, it should involve economic rights and social rights and organization and voice and bargaining power, social protection, of course, legal identity, so many dimensions of what could be formalization. And it's really a, a question of the mix and the sequencing and what's best for different groups of informal workers. And that it should include um, reducing costs as well as increasing benefits. A lot of the emphasis has been on reducing the costs of registering an enterprise so that more enterprises will become so-called formal. Um, so that's the cost of becoming formal, but there are also some benefits of being formal that should accrue if you formalize. And it's not always clear that those are readily available. Um, and then there are costs of being informal that should be reduced. And one of them that we fight a lot is the dominant negative narratives that lead to very punitive actions by the state in most regards. And so we're, we, we talk a lot and we go about reducing the negatives and increasing the positives. And we actually sing a ditty about that from one of the songs, if you, Mr. In Between, if you remember that song. Uh, the other is that it has to be an incremental process because to be fully formal and not on a sort of continuum between informality and formality, there are these multiple dimensions and they can't be, you can't turn a switch and suddenly have all of those dimensions for them. But it also has to be an inclusive process. You have to consult with the organizations of workers, with the workers to know which which of the dimensions in what sequence are most important to them. And like in Thailand, if you have so much of the universal social protection, then other dimensions um, become more important. Uh, so we have that rethinking that's happened, which is very positive, but we also have, uh, because formalization has become sort of on the agenda, we have a lot of formalization schemes that as you suggest, can be false or um, negative in different ways. So for the organizations of workers, uh, we have worked out some guidelines of what they should be thinking about if they enter into a negotiation as in NEDLAC in South Africa. And, you know, one is who and what is being formalized, right? It's never very clear what really is being done in the name of formalization. And I can share slides on this. The, what, the other is what problem is being addressed? What is the problem that we're seeking to, uh, to, to solve? And whose interests are being served in the formalization process? Um, and then what is actually involved? Is it just compliance with regulations and taxations? Or does it also include some benefits and protections? Again, who is impacted and how? And then a question about who is involved in the design, the implementation and the monitoring of the, the formalization initiative. And we have a lot of sub questions in there, but we felt it was important for the workers to keep asking these questions when they engage um, in these formalization discussions. Um, just to say that when it comes to the ILO recommendation 204, which was adopted in 2015, 
as with all ILO standards, it, there was a two year discussion of that standard before it was adopted. And before the first year, before 2014, uh, WIGO held three regional workshops with 55 organizations from 24 countries that came up with a common platform of demands of what formalization meant to them, right? Which I could share again, but what is important is that there were some core common demands that all the workers had, which was, one was organization voice and bargaining power. The other was legal identity and standing. You know, registration is registration, but they want to be, have a legal standing, be recognized as economic agents or workers and then a range of economic rights, not just labor, because if you're self-employed, then commercial rights and property rights, also um, the right to use public space, there are a whole lot of rights that uh, are important and social rights, including social protection, social services. They need basic infrastructure services to make their workplace productive and transport services. And then there's sector specific demands. Um, if you're a domestic worker, you're more like what the ILO is familiar with. You're asking about worker rights and labor protection. But if you're a home-based producer, you want housing tenure, you want basic infrastructure services at your home as workplace. You want mixed use zoning so you can work in your own residence. And if you're self-employed, you want market access. If you're subcontracted, you want better more regular work orders, a range of issues. Street vendors, a secure place to bend is so important, including the protection of their um, natural markets. And for them, they're the key ones where the reduction of all the negatives, the confiscations, the evictions, the daily harassment, the frequent bribes, all of that needing to be reduced. And the waste pickers, they need access to waste. They want a right to bid for solid waste management contracts. So public procurement enters in warehouses and equipment uh, and also reduced harassment. So there are common demands, but also sector specific demands. And uh, we were quite pleased with the outcomes of ILO recommendation 204 because of several things. One is the recognition that most informal workers are indeed from poor households trying to earn an honest living actually against great odds rather than the negative stereotype. And most informal economic units are single person or family units. This whole sort of enterprise entrepreneurial culture really works against what informal uh, enterprises are. We actually try to avoid that word, <laughs> the four <laughs> economic units. And then the other is that informal livelihoods should not be destroyed in the process of formalization. The idea is not that all of them are gonna give up what they're doing now and get some formal job because that's just not going to happen. They ha will have to continue doing what they do, but with uh, more formality. And then regulated use of public space for those in urban areas and regulated use of natural resources for in rural areas were seen as essential to livelihoods. And those were big provisions. Um, and if just one thing I wanted to share is some examples of formalization in four of the five countries that you studied. Uh, we, didn't, we don't work in Morocco, unfortunately, we would like to, but um, in Ghana, and I don't know if this comes into the case study, there's, um, a lot of the informal workers in Accra were registered with the National Health Insurance Scheme. And this took a bit of doing, there's a long story behind it, but we got them. And then there's a group of workers in the built markets of Accra and elsewhere that were of concern. These are the market headquarters called the Kayaye, who are Muslim migrants from the north of Ghana. And they were being charged a tax, uh, uh, I forget whether it was daily or weekly, as if they were self-employed, like the vendors, the market traders in the markets. But they actually are paid by the traders or by the customers, they're not self-employed. And we were able to get that tax lifted so they no longer have to pay an unfair tax. So sometimes formalization is the reduction of a negative like that, if you will. Um, in India, as you know, there's the Street Vendors Act and there's the municipal contract for waste pickers in Pune. 
Um, South Africa, this process that Hamida referred to is very important because it's one of, it's a national process to discuss formalization, but fighting a very narrow interpretation of what formalization means as Hamida suggested and trying to say it's not just registration and taxation. Uh, and another thing that happened during COVID was in that South Africa that was street vendors were designated or deemed to be essential workers, which was very helpful. And there was some protocol for making street vending safe for the vendors and the customers. And Thailand, in, in addition to the universal um, coverage scheme for health and the universal pension, um, there's the Home Workers Protection Act 2010 modeled on the Convention 177 for homework. And there is the 2012 ministerial regulation um, for domestic workers, which extends the rights and regulations of the labor reforms that were earlier, the Labor Protection Act of 1998 to domestic workers. And again, this is based on the ILO um, Convention 189 on domestic workers. Um, and I would just like, before I conclude, um, just to say that all these demands and examples are for all informal workers or for specific groups of informal workers, not only for women informal workers. And the organizations of informal workers that are involved in making these demands and negotiating these examples uh, had both women and men workers for the most part. And so we feel that formalization needs to be gender sensitive, but it really needs to be sensitive to the structural disadvantages and needs of all informal workers, because on average, they are poor and they're, they're from poor households. And then there are the very specific groups of informal workers and their specific needs. And then women within those groups that you have to sort of do a nested kind of analysis and strategy. So I just want to end by formalization and intersectionality that I really think what we need to look at is um, the structural disadvantages that women face as women, but also as workers. And of course, as members of different classes and of different groups by race and ethnicity. But if we look at the intersection of formalization and intersectionality, it's this need to address the structural disadvantages that all informal workers face, that specific groups, and then the specific dis structural disadvantages that women face um, within the informal economy. Because there's a lot of commonality between women and men within specific groups of the informal economy, right? The waste pickers have a lot in common compared to the street vendors. So I'll end on a call for formalization and intersectionality if you will. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. That was terrific. I mean, what a vast sweep. And I think you ended on a very, very important note. So thanks a lot for that. Okay, next, I'm really happy to welcome Diane Elson, who again needs no introduction. I mean, if, if feminist economics exists at all, it's very much a part of the efforts of Diane and people like her who have really been uh, path breaking and mentors to all of us and also given us very important concepts that we use all the time even without thinking uh, in terms of double burden and, and the importance of care and so many other things. So uh, Diane, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you. I was delighted to be asked to join this panel and to help launch this book because I find it's a really interesting book and I particularly liked the way, I don't have the depth of work and knowledge about inform, informal economic activities and, and how to advance the, 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 the living standards of informal workers that Marty does and that those of you who have done these five great case studies do. So I wanted to pick up on one thing that struck me about the case studies that I liked was the way that it also situated the detail in the social, the cultural and the economic context of the five countries that were studied and particularly pick up the point that I think Diati has made about the significance of the macroeconomic context the extent to which total employment is growing and wages are rising 
because I think any legislation that tries to improve the conditions of workers, the kind of impact that it has, depends on this overall extent to which total employment is growing and wages are rising and the range of opportunities uh, they, they have available. And it was interesting to learn from these five case studies that in Thailand, where compared with the others, there's been a better track record of employment creation and rising wages. The, the strategies, the, the more legal strategies to formalize the informal were in, in many cases ha had better impacts for the workers they were supposed to help than they did in countries where there's a high levels of unemployment, where um, employment creation is, 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 is stagnated, wages are not rising. Uh, and that's both in terms of the range of opportunities that poor workers have available to them, poor people have available to them, and also the pressures on employers. If they don't have to compete to get workers, either directly or indirectly, then they're going to offer less better terms and conditions than, than, work, than employers that face a tight labour market. So I wanted to say a little bit about how employment creation can be stimulated and sustained in ways that will benefit people undertaking informal work and make it more likely that these different strategies, often legal strategies around conventions, laws, registration and so forth, are more likely to be benefit rather than have these unintended negative impacts that the case studies brought out. So I want to focus on the ways in which the state can support the more positive aspects of formalization through both direct and indirect employment creation. So in terms of direct employment creation, there's expansion of public sector employment, but in ways that formalize all workers. And Chandu mentioned that in India, and I think India's not alone, a lot of people who, who are in some sense employees of the state are informal. They're not formal. They don't have all the benefits that formal employees have. And in some countries, and I think there are others besides India, um, some public services depend on a, a lot of workers who are classified as volunteers, community health workers in many, many countries have this status. So they don't have a formal status worker, they don't get the pay of worker, they're not really regarded as workers at all. So clearly, doing something about this and making sure that all of these workers who are contributing as employees or as vol so-called volunteers to public services uh, get uh, the proper terms and conditions that go along with formal work is one thing that states can do, governments can do. A second is in, term, in terms of procurement, and Marty has mentioned this issue of the relationship between public sector procurement and informal workers, and I know there are these good examples of waste picker organisations in some countries which are able uh, to get contracts from the public sector for waste picking work, where the waste pickers were organised and there was an association or a cooperative uh, that could... Um, uh, bid for contracts, but that bidding for contracts is often in a very disadvantageous concept, context if public procurement is being driven by the goal of minimizing the costs and giving the contract to the bidder that can say we'll deliver this service at the lowest financial cost, disregarding social value disregarding what public sector procurement can do to raise living standards of a wide range of people to in, in, improve their way of life, the social value. So I think another thing is to change the rules for public sector procurement to emphasize social value rather than minimum financial cost and to deliberately go out to see how far you can develop procurement in partnership with organizations of informal workers. Waste pickers is one, care services could be another, um, where there are associations of, um, of workers whose status at the moment may be informal, but who provide, and indeed domestic 
um, um, domestic people who provide paid domestic services to households can also uh, form in, into cooperatives and provide these services as cooperatives rather than as individuals. But I think public procurement has a um, uh, an important role to play, provided the rules of public procurement are changed and there's a deliberate attempt to see how far public procurement can be used to support informal workers. The second is, of course, indirect employment creation, because a lot of the employment uh, uh, creation that the state sustains is not through its direct public sector employment or its public sector procurement, but through creating expanding markets for the private sector, ensuring the expansion of aggregate demand rather than depressing aggregate demand through policies that focus too much on reduction of budget deficits and public debt. Austerity policies are not going to help in sustaining employment creation and in creating a context which is going to increase the bargaining power of informal workers. But these more expansionary policies require the creation of more fiscal space. Now, at the moment, rich countries like the one I'm speaking from, the UK, can do this right now with no problem through, through um, selling bonds, through borrowing in their own currency, through central banks, which will buy up all of these bonds uh, in a process of essentially kind of making, creating money. And that will sustain the kind of um, uh, recovery strategies that Biden in the USA is now uh, trying to put forward. But that option is not open to most of the countries in middle income countries and low income countries, I think including the ones in these case studies um, who can't borrow in their own currency and who are very constrained at the moment in the kind of fiscal space they have. So therefore we need international, international efforts, the international initiatives on debt restructuring to enable countries to have the fiscal space. And then we need the pressure from below for them to use that fiscal space in ways that will positively support legal changes that could be of benefit to informal workers. So I think we need these efforts to link the kind of micro and the MISA, which Marty has talked about so eloquently, and which the, and which the five country case studies have a wealth of rich detail on, uh, with the macro, both national and international levels, so that good new laws that get passed uh, can actually generate real economic and social benefits. But anyway, congratulations to everybody uh, on the book from which I learned an awful lot. Thanks so much, Diane. And it's terrific that you brought up not just the macro aspect, but also the international dimension, which is absolutely important and, and we really cannot get away from. So thank you so much for that. And then uh, last and definitely not least, it's a great honor and delight to uh, welcome Pasuk Pongpaichit, who's been our mentor and colleague for a very, very long time, and is also one of the most eminent development economists in the Asian region, who's done huge amounts of work on the political economy of Thai development in different aspects and uh, a whole lot of, in fact, one of her first early and most fascinating pieces of work was precisely on sex workers in Thailand and the implications of being informal in that context some decades ago. And so I know that Basuk will have a lot to say on this, so I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Charity, and hello to everyone. I completely agree. I. I would like to thank Jayati and to all the researchers uh, to produce this book. I have learned a lot reading from what you have done. I completely agree that the formalization of women employment is an urgent issue to be addressed by all governments in developing countries. And I can see the contributions and important roles of organization like the WEIGO, WIGO, it's called WIGO, and trade unions. I just have a few points to support GRT's conclusion with some observation on some uh, development issues. 
uh, some of the thing I'm going to talk about would overlap with some of the things that Marty and Elson talk about. But since I have prepared, I, I will just read it out anyway, okay? It is a paradox. My first point is that it is a paradox that the majority of the workers in developing world are informal, unregistered workers. Yet the government development strategies and policies do not focus on nurturing and improving their livelihood and work conditions so that they could contribute productively to society and to the tax revenue in the end to be used for nurturing the society further. The means to incorporate informal workers into the society's development programs and, and annual budgeting are well known, yet they are being ignored or are being implemented half-heartedly. And particularly the issue of liberalization of labor markets certainly harm formalization. This is seen very much in the Indian case. And, and these, these kind of things reflect lack of political will on the part of these governments, many of whom cultivate symbiotic relationships with big formal corporations inside and outside with a view to rely on them as spearheads of economic growth, or in some cases for political support as well. In other cases, there is just inertia. And in this context, workers who can form associations or are associated with trade unions or social movements have been able to protect their rights and avoid injustice much better than any uh, unorganized one. However, under the influence of neoliberalism, many governments in developing countries discourage trade unions and labor associations. This right to organize and collective bargaining should be brought back, encourage, and encourage, particularly amongst informal workers also. And there should have to be a connection also between the um, already organized traditional trade unions and, and um, uh, the, the, the informal uh, uh, workers. I think these are something which are lacking. My second point is that with a change of mindsets and attitudes, government and local planners of city and towns of developing countries can play central roles in promoting informal workers and benefiting from them enormously. Town planners should help to promote informal sector activities such as by providing public spaces for street vendors, for recycling of wastes, instead of pushing them out like what's been going on in Thailand and in China. And by giving informal workers access to public procurements like what uh, both uh, Marty Chen and I think Diane also talk about. And not only that, uh, government, these governments and town planners should invest in public transportation, other logistics, including internet, uh, access to help facilitate their mobility, their activities, and incentives should be given to formal firms to employ young females in experience in work to get employment via tax breaks or outright wage subsidies. These are the kind of thing that, that could be done. And such policies are good in time of recession or no recession, particularly special employment programs, informal work, designed for single mothers, for example, that are so lacking. My third point is that governments of developing countries must aim for universal social protection programs for the society's survival, as this imperative goes beyond the issue of women's welfare, as Charity had pointed out. All society needs this to cope with not only poverty, but also with the adverse impact of climate change and possible pandemic like COVID-19 in the future that, that people have, think that we're going to face some more of these. And the universal social protection may begin from the most urgent areas such as education for children, make it free 
from the young age, skill training for adults, retraining in the older generation, national pension for the age, and maternity care for mothers. And then, you know, uh, uh, moving on to some other um, social welfare, depending on the ability. It is also vital to supply everyday amenities for the home, to the home of these people, especially tap water, electricity or solar energy and sanitation and waste collection. Because some of these basic amenities are very important to improve the lives and well being of the women. The imperative for universal social protection is ever more urgent in view of the challenges and risks from the platform economy that has descended on us so suddenly, and everybody is now in a, a state of what to do, and the ILO is calling for all government of every, every country to come together to, uh, to talk about this and yet nothing has happened yet. My last point on this is about financing these schemes, about how to increase the tax revenues with equity and fairness and design of core payments for the social welfare scheme. This is going to be very big thing for all these developing countries. Now, comparing India and Thailand, the pre-COVID ratio of tax revenue to GDP was about 15 cents, but the share of military expenditure in total spending is very different. 2.4% for India, 1.3% for Thailand. 1.3% for Thailand is already very big, and 2.4% for India is enormous. This must reduce the scope for India to spend on infrastructure and social welfare provisions compared to Thailand and some of the things that that should be a tap water to the home of these women, you know, could have come out of this uh, defense budget. Morocco also spent a lot on military expenditure, over 3% of the annual budget. I don't know why Morocco wants to spend so much money on defense, such small country. And even if there's a war, they can't protect themselves anyway. One wonders if it could not have been used for more productively for improving infrastructures and welfare facilities. The share of other three countries are below 1%, which is good, and they could reduce further. I have also been asked why formal employment expanded in Thailand during the period of rapid growth more than elsewhere. There are several reasons. A brief answer is this. First, the boom in foreign direct investment after the Plaza Accords in 1980s was very fast and very huge. Second, you know, there, there was at the time uh, three factories open from Japan every three days. Second, the first wave of FDI went into low skill industries like garments where the workforce was informal. But the second wave went into electronics, electrical and automotive. The job task in these firm required specific skills Firms had an interest in stabilizing their workforces by providing formal benefits. The third wave has been in services, including medical, law, accounting, architecture, real estate, et cetera, kind of firms. Again, they have incentives to stabilize their workforce. And of course, as uh, Jessica was saying that uh, Thailand at the time also has been investing a lot in education. And so by the time 1970, 1980, we have plenty of supply of well-educated um, uh, women and men who can supply these firms. Again, uh, for when we move into the third world of services, they have incentives to stabilize the workforce. And also many foreign firms are operating semi-legally and they are careful to obey rules on matters such as social security and other labor protection. Now, another thing in comparison to India is that Thailand demographic transition has begun already by the 1980s. So the number of new entrants to the labor force has declined start to decline and by 2000 we are having we are entering um, 
uh, uh, labor shortage situation with with a quickly aging society. So this is a different kind of scenario, macro scenario between Thailand and uh, India. Um, well, on the sex industry, if you ask me a question, I will answer. But I think my time is up, I will stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, Pasuk, for putting this into this broad developmental context. You know, I was hoping that we would get everybody to ask their questions individually because the, uh, there's so many, it's much nicer to have a conversation, but there's so many questions that I will only be able to do this for a few. I'm going to request six people to just ask their questions. These are very interesting questions, which I think everybody deserves to hear. And then we will uh, get all of you to respond and then we'll do the second round, if that's all right with everyone. So I'm going to begin by asking Caroline, uh, Shainaz Hussain. Caroline, can you unmute yourself, please, and ask your question? And just to let everyone know, I'm going to ask Caroline, I'm going to ask Bob Polin, and Nancy Fulbre, Nancy Kachingwe, Shraddha Jain, and Ruth Pearson to ask the first round of questions. Thanks so much. Go ahead, Caroline. Thank you, Professor Ghosh um, and all the speakers. It was really wonderful. I'm sitting here in Toronto and I'm feeling really, really inspired amidst uh, lockdown. So I really appreciate um, these ideas because it's going to help me with my own work. I work on the banker ladies among, and looking specifically at the African diaspora in the Americas. Um, so my question, um, I put it in the chat, but it's for, um, I'm interested in knowing um, what strategies, I believe Marty and Jessica, um, some you've talked about ways we can incorporate the very women who are working in the informal sector. How do we get them um, to participate in policy making um, so that it's not just done by elite bureaucrats, but they actually have a voice on what, how to regulate or do we need regulation? Um, that's one. That's my first part of the question. And then the second part here in Canada, we're dealing with the, t the actual term of informality. A lot of Indigenous groups refuse informality. They're using the term non-formal. So I'm curious to hear uh, some feedback. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. Uh, Bob Polin had a really interesting conceptual question, which I think, uh, Bob, if you can please unmute. Hi. Um, well, this, yeah, I, I just want to first say it's been really great listening to the speakers. Um, and hello to Marty Chen, who I haven't been in touch with for a long time. <laughs> but Marty, uh, years ago, recruited myself and, and James Hines into it, working on this issue of informality. And I've been struggling ever since Marty got me into it. Uh, as to how we think about informality in the context of macroeconomic theory and policy. Uh, any variant of uh, macroeconomic theory and policy uh, has a, as a central concept um, unemployment and uh, full employment as a macro policy goal. But obviously um, these are really inadequate, uh, you know, very badly inadequate uh, when we uh, incorporate the realities of informality. I have to say that having been teaching macro, you know, PhD macro for decades, uh, certainly since Marty uh, got me into it, I've been struggling with exactly how to deal with this reality and I've never succeeded. So I'm hoping uh, people on the panel can give me some insight here on how we incorporate seriously informality into what we do in macroeconomics. We're clearly going to have to have another seminar to answer that question, but yeah, that's a very, very important issue. Uh, Nancy Fulbray had uh, also a very important question. Nancy, can you uh, unmute? I think I'm unmuted. Oh, now. great. Yeah. Can you hear me? A uh, really great discussion. Um, I'm uh, really eager to hear the answer or possible answers to Bob's question. Uh, I want to, and I really love the emphasis on universal social protection as a key element, but I'm particularly interested in childcare provision and whether there's a sense that that is, could be a key intervention or if, is it less relevant than others or what do we know about that? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Nancy Kachingwe, can you, Nancy, are you there? Can you unmute? 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I don't have. Yeah, I can't switch on the video. Um, the yeah, my question um was around uh, statistics because uh we you we want to be able to use a lot of the household surveys and labor force uh, surveys that are done quite regularly um but they are often usually quite poor in terms of providing information about the informal sector and i was just wondering whether from the case studies whether there were any recommendations that um might have emerged in terms of how to do these sort of much larger national level surveys much better so that policy can then um, policy can then be shaped to respond because a lot of what we saw in COVID was just that governments didn't even know who was out there and what they were doing in order to even shape responses for them. The informal sector is just sort of treated as one big blob, but uh, congratulations also for the publication of the book. Uh, looking forward to the case studies and to be able to make these different comparisons between countries and seeing different um, case studies from there. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, Ruth Pearson had an interesting question. Ruth, can you unmute? Yeah, hello. Um, thank you for the presentations and really interesting discussions. Um, on issues that I've been very passionately interested in for many decades. Um, and hello to all the colleagues on the call that I've worked with over the years. <laughs> what I wanted to ask um, is about um, the implications for migrant workers, because a lot of the discussion about formalization is contingent on um, public sector support. Um, and I think, you know, one of the issues that's come out really clearly in the discussion is the importance of um, universal provision, regardless of the registration and the regulation of the kind of enterprise that people work in. But very often, because um, this, it, this um, requires that, um, you know, there are citizens, uh, citizenship would be a direct um, access to benefit, um, social security, social protection, and so, et cetera. What does that say about the many hundreds of thousands of transborder migrant workers who are irregular, if not illegal, and what would be the impact on their entitlements, access to education to for their children, to health, and so on and so forth? I just wondered if the case studies could eliminate that a bit. Great, thank you so much. You know, I'm going to be greedy and add some more questions if possible. And I know this is a lot for all of you because I don't know, think we'll have time for a second round. So I'm just going to fit in a few more questions here. Shukti Das Gupta had some, a bunch of interesting questions. Shukti, can you unmute? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Well, yeah. Lovely. To, oh, now we can even see you. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> lovely to Bye. see you. All and congratulations on the book and so many known faces. So, you know, hello to everyone. <laughs> uh, my question, I put it on the chat box. You know, I found some of the findings extremely interesting. Uh, for example, in Ghana, Jaitidi, you said that you know the regulation did not necessarily lead to decent work. In Thailand, uh, the fact that there is universal social protection and some of the workers did not necessarily want to be formal. In India, Chandru also mentioned a bunch of very interesting things, especially that uh, formalization of enterprises did not always percolate to workers. And you know, today we are bringing out a major report for the Latin America region, uh, looking at uh, the labor market in the context of COVID. And so one of the most interesting findings there, I think the report is not yet out, it will be out in the course of the day today, is that there has been huge declines in informal employment. And of course, a lot of those are women, many of them have been pushed out of the labor market, uh, moving into inactivity. But what is also interesting is that recovery, you know, employment recovery is also in the informal segments. And that raises some very important and interesting policy issues. You know, do we need to rethink some of the policies and own informality? Is it that legal strategies only work when the macro context is uh, favorable? So I just wanted to put it out there. Thank you. 
Wow. Okay. And listen, I'm sorry to do this to you, but two more questions and then that's it. And I'm going to give it back to the panel for responses. So um, we have Midul Ipin and then Fitria. So, and then these will be the last two questions for this round. Go ahead, Midul. Um, uh, yeah. Good evening. Good afternoon. And thank you so much, uh, Jayati. And I really found it fascinating. Um, my question actually was because Chandru had mentioned it, but it could be to anyone, uh, which is that uh, raising wages is, of course, the best way of formalizing the informal workers because they are generally, unlike in Thailand, below the minimum wage. And uh, that would be the best way if we could raise it. But we know that there is usually a backlash from the employers if you raise the wage. So in that sense, Chandru, isn't it wiser that the government has these insure, the insurance schemes or the health schemes, and as in Kerala, and like in Thailand they are doing, we also have a good public distribution system. So that would be a big help to the workers while we try to improve their earnings through product change or organizational change in the places of work. This was my question, isn't that a better thing to do rather than, because wages becomes difficult, which Kerala tried to do through the tripartite uh, welfare fund boards, if you know. The traditional sector workers, they try to formalize by giving them the statutory benefits but those benefits were on top of a, a very small minimum wage. So you get one rupee as dearness allowance, or you get two rupees as employees provident fund doesn't help much. But that was an attempt to formalize the uh, women workers in the traditional sectors. So my question is, we have to have both the things happening, you know, health, food, et cetera, on one hand, and also try to raise their minimum earnings. Sorry for the long question, sorry. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Midul. And finally, we have Pitriya. Pitya, can you unmute, please? Hello, everyone. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much for holding this webinar. Uh, so I'm in the middle of writing my thesis about the home-based worker. And as we all know, there's so many types on, of informal workers, and each of them always has a different purposes and needs. And one of the informal workers that we all know is home-based worker that related with the global supply chain. And in Indonesia until now, like they're still struggling to be recognized as informal workers. Even the workers itself sometimes still aren't aware about their position as informal worker. And my question is how to solve this kind of problem to for them to like, recognize themselves and so they will have the better right as a worker. That's all for my question. Thank you, thank you so much. You know, uh, I'm going to now open it up and it's of course there are questions to everybody including the people who have written chapters. So I, I'm not sure where to begin. Shall we begin very quickly with the people who have um, written chapters and then we move back to the panelists. I want to add, there are a bunch of other questions. I just noticed that there are some interesting questions on where gig workers fit in. Anna Sherman has an interesting question on whether formalizing ASHA workers would demotivate them, uh, which is a very controversial point. I can see that we will get a lot of discussion on that. So could I begin with, let's say very briefly, all of the uh, chapter writers, and then we go back to the panelists. So Hamida, would you like to respond to anything? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jyoti. So it was directed to me, right? Sorry, I was busy looking at the chat. No, I'm saying, so, are there any questions you wish to answer? If not, we move on. So Yes, no, no. I, I was just making sure that you had asked me to respond. So yes, yes thank you very much. I would. Yes. Um, I think the, um, I'd like to raise the issue around formalization versus informalization. I think there's a, there's a phenomena or some kind of perception that if you become, if you're formal, and you formally employed, therefore you are better off. I think that's a, that's a myth that we need to dispel. I work within the formal sector. South Africa's workers, by and large, and Kasatu largely organizes workers in the formal economy. But we have formal work, workers in the formal economy that are both formal and informal. And in many instances, you'll find that the precarity, levels of vulnerability, levels of exploitation, and the patriarchal relations that we're trying to, to you know, challenge when we talk about formalization are inherent in the formal sector as well. So I think it's very, you know, when we when we aspiring towards the improvement 
of workers' lives. And women in particular, I think it's about the social benefits, it's about the recognition um, that people are workers, it's about um, challenging the key uh, conditions that actually create exploitation and vulnerability, and, and not necessarily an either or. I think that uh, that's really something that I, I'd, I'd like to tease out. I think some of the, the questions in the chat I've answered um, to most people that I thought was relevant to me. Thanks. Thanks so much, Hamida. Um, Jessica, go ahead. Okay, there's a few of these that I can um, address. Uh, the first one about uh, from Nancy about the statistics, um, and statistics are usually um, quite poor. Um, that was something that we actually talked a lot about uh, when we were uh, kind of in the beginning phases of this project, uh, because a lot of uh, countries don't have statistics, but Thailand was really, really lucky uh, we have the labor force survey that's done, it's actually conducted throughout the year and then reported on a quarterly basis. And I think it's that every third quarter, they do what's called the informal survey. And so they actually ask questions that are able to then kind of tease out who's informal um, in the economy and then also ask questions about um, um, work conditions um, in addition to just uh, wages as well. And so in many ways, I feel like Thailand actually had a pretty good sense of, you know, who was informal and, you know, who's going to be you know, impacted in the, um, you know, COVID crisis, for example. So um, that's been um, really nice to be able to work with. And I think that uh, the model that uh, Thailand has um, um, although I would love to see some additional questions being asked, I think it could be uh, used in other country contexts with the regular labor force survey. Um, in terms of uh, the child care provision, um, uh, Nancy Fulbray asked about, um, in, it would, I would love to see that here in Thailand. So we have just recently gotten um, child, uh, I'm sorry, can think of the, the, the there's the child payment um, that was um, added to the um, the section 40 of the social security um, which is social security for uh, uh, voluntary social security for informal workers and so that was sort of a step in th that type of direction but at least in the Thai context I don't see any type of child care um, provision um, coming um, even though that would be nice um, I wanted to say something quickly about informality and macroeconomic theory. Uh, this is just a really interesting one. As I mentioned before, last 10 years, the unemployment rate in Thailand is about 1%. And if you flip to the back of The Economist magazine, Thailand is always kind of at the top of the list in terms of low unemployment. And the reason why is because we do follow the ILO definition of unemployment. Employment. And so the question that's asked in the labor force survey is, have you done any work uh, for pay in the last seven days? Well, you could have basically sold eggs to your neighbor and that would have been counted as work and that means that you're employed. So um, so what is the definition of employed? And um, following that definition to the T is going to give you a very different unemployment rate as than you would in the United States, for example. And so some people are like, well, then it should just be formal workers. Well, then we would have basically two thirds of the country unemployed. So, um, so there's a, um, interesting things to think about. And I do think that, you know, institutional environment as well as, you know, two sectors as formal and informal could be um, uh, incorporated into macroeconomic uh, models um, and make great, um, questions for a PhD uh, macro class. Um, finally, I just wanted to address uh, Ruth's um, question about the migrant workers. And I know that we had uh, talked about this at IAFI, um, was that a couple years ago now? <laughs> I don't know, when was that? <laughs> it's a couple years ago, I think. Um, and the fact that we had talked long and hard about whether we we're gonna talk about migrant workers in this particular project, and we decided not to, to really concentrate on um, nationals. But of course, this kind of leaves a really big gaping hole, and especially in the context of Thailand. And um, just thinking about um, healthcare even the healthcare that uh, that migrant workers who do come through the the channel like the uh, uh, official channels they do get is actually very similar to our universal healthcare and it actually does um, provide care and I certainly know a lot of people um, um, that I've worked with who have used the medical system and have had a um, few problems. However, I've had a, a master student do a project on access to medical care, even with this um, type of insurance. And a lot of people are reluctant to use it because they can't get the time off. So even though they have uh, this type of um, formal um, health care, it's very, very difficult to use. And so they still just go to the pharmacy instead. And I think these types of things really do need to be addressed in the Thai context. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks so much, Jessica. Chandru. Yeah, thanks. Um, very quickly, just uh, three points. The first is, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd also like to come in on this question of the statistics. Um, uh, you know, India is one sort of environment in which, because of a long tradition, we have these national sample surveys, which uh, cover in multiple ways what would be the unorganized uh, sector or the informal sector. Uh, one problem which, you, which a user has in using this, these large and enormous data sets, of course, is there is no single definition with which surveys operate. So you can have a surveys of an organized sector in which you're saying that if a unit has uh, 10 workers or less, or less than 10 workers uh, using power or less than 20 workers without using power, that would be the, the target uh, entity I'm looking at. You could have other definitions which actually you know, are closer to the ILO's definition of informality and the survey run on this basis. And, and the real problem is that there one set of surveys, which actually particularly the, the employment unemployment surveys are, are actually household surveys, but another set of surveys are, I agree with, with Marty, that's not the right word, but they are enterprise surveys, the enterprise-based surveys, you know, or unit-based surveys. So you actually capture very different things. So you end up with a situation where you have a large data set, but if you want to analyze this, it doesn't really work. And one particular problem with all of this is, if you begin to look for information which gives you the interaction or the interlinkages between the formal and the informal sector, there's very little because it just tries to deal with the informal sector as the informal sector and gives you a set of survey results. Whereas what you're really looking for is the dynamic which emerges when because of the interlinkages and, and, and interaction between these two sectors. That's, that's just based on the India. Well, um, uh, Mridhul's question, you know, I, I don't know why we have to look at it that, that way that say that, okay, we need, we, need, we need social protection, we need universal social protection, but we can't therefore say that earnings and wages should not be at a level which constitute some basic definition of, a, of, 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 of decent work, you know? So, so we need both. And uh, the whole point is in particular, you cannot have so, sort of marginal state action to reach social protection to people as a substitute or, 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 or as a way of dealing with the fact that the informal sector has got very exploitative labor relations. I mean, you cannot actually handle the problem of exploitative labor relations there with the state coming in with some social protection measures. The state should do its work on social protection, but we should have something out there which increases the productivity of these entities such that they are in a position to be able to ensure earnings if, if they're self-employed or, or wages which actually uh, meet some condition, I mean, some criteria of what, what constitutes decent work. Finally, yeah, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. That's okay. what I meant. Yeah, we're running out of time. So, Chandru, yeah. Yeah, then, then I, 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 I no, just... No, no, no. Finally, you know, go ahead. I, you know, I can't even begin to answer Bob's question, but I was, I was just wondering whether, you know, there's, there's one issue here that, you know, if, if, if you have macro policy, which let us say in the first instance impacts the, the organized sector, because state expenditures or whatever it is, uh, works its way through in the initial instance to, to that part of the economy. You know, in, in part, you, you, you expect results as if you have a homogenized uh, labor market. You know, if you have labor market segmentation, which is massive, then actually you don't have the flow of the effects of macroeconomic interventions to the informal sector, which if you actually had the flow there, the likely multiplier effects of income generation there could possibly be greater than the incomes which get generated in the corporate se sector, which of course a large part of it goes to profits, etc. So maybe the existence of, of, of that kind of segmentation which comes out of informality won't allow the work, you know, the working of many of the things. But this, this is just a thought and for you to, to respond to. Thanks so much, Chandru. Okay, I'm going to go reverse order perhaps in this now and first Pasuk, then Diane and then Marty. Um, I, <clears throat> I I want to say something about the, the implication of the U universal uh, welfare program on migrant workers. In, in Thailand, uh, there was a reluctance uh, in the beginning, you know, with we have lots of migrants from Myanmar and Laos and Cambodia. And, uh, uh, and when they're sick, who is going to take care of them? Um, but the... Uh, the medical profession in, in the hospital insists that if they come to the hospital, we will treat them. And, you know, there, there was a bit hoo-ha, you know, 
objection uh, in some quarter. But eventually, I think everybody was persuaded and thought that it's a good idea. They come to work for us. And if they're sick, we take care of them. So what? So, so, what? so in the end, you know, that, that was uh, become a, a norm. And I think uh, there's some charge on them, uh, very, very low, very low charge as a token. So now all the migrant workers uh, can go to the hospital. And the social security program also now um, allow them to make a contribution, a very small amount, so that they can have enter, they can enter in some of the program, like uh, the informal sector workers, because the social security program in Thailand are for formal sector only, but later they extended to the informal workers with a special special program. And so the, the migrant also come in in this way too. Um, I'm not sure what Sukti, I didn't hear. Did Sukti say that uh, the, uh, uh, the informal, informal workers decline in, in the book, decline from her report and whether the recovery after COVID also happened among the informal sector first. Now that's, that's, that's also the case in Thailand too. What we found in Thailand is that the agricultural sector, um, um, even though it, it has been in decline over a long period of time, but in the COVID period, fishery and uh, the agricultural sector are the sector that uh, recover was, was sustaining us by keep on producing. And uh, in fact, uh, they continue to do so and even export the, the food. So um, I think people began to appreciate this a little bit. I think we should, we should look into this a little bit more. Thank you so much, Basu. Diane. I'll just pick up the point that uh, Bob Holland raised about um, how do we take into account in, in thinking about the macroeconomy? The, these, I would say it's, it's all these very, very, very varied forms of employment. And in the, we looked at this issue in a report I, uh, for a commission I chaired in the UK about creating a gender equal economy. And we argued that you can't just have one indicator on employment or employment. You really need a battery of indicators that will um, pay some attention to the quality of the work. Uh, the, because at the moment, say in the UK, we've got a government that says, oh, look, you know, the labor market was doing very well. It's going to do very well again because the, the uh, headline rates of employment were high, but the quality of the work is deteriorating. So you definitely, I think, need a, a wider range of indicators. And maybe we also need multi-sector models. But I think um, we're hoping that you, Master Damhurst, will take up this issue and we'll organize some further discussions of it. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. <laughs> okay, Marty. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll speak to three or four. Um, one is what Caroline and I'm not sure of the name, our sister from Indonesia raised about, you know, how do workers <laughs> get their voice heard in policy making. And I think there's two ingredients that are absolutely essential. And one is organization. They have to be organized. It's collective voice and collective representation that is possible. The other is that we need data because data in the hands of the workers is power. And with that, they can raise their visibility and try to get a seat at the table. We also have to have mindset change at the top, people willing to listen. Um, on the data, just to say that there's been tremendous progress made over the last 20 years. There's an improved expanded definition with the ILO there is work on the classification of status and employment and a lot of the other statistical measures. And when we first started this work <laughs> with the ILO, there was no data in the labor force survey on this. They had separate enterprise surveys. And now we have more than a hundred countries uh, using the, the official statistical definitions and reporting to the ILO. So it made possible the first ever global estimates in uh, 2018. Um, so there's, you know, people I can point Nancy and other people to where that work is happening. On Bob's question, <laughs> I'd love to further engage. 
But just on the revenue side, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on taxation um, because it's assumed it's the informal economy that's not paying taxes. And we just heard that 55 major companies in the US haven't paid federal tax in one year and some of them in three years. So the whole taxation issue just needs to be completely unpacked and repacked. And then of course, on the expenditure side, uh, there's a lot to think about public procurement and expenditure. But I'm also intrigued by what informal economy means for labor economics more generally, because 44% of all workers in the world are self-employed. And if you move over to the informal employment, it's two thirds or three quarters. So, you know, James Hines taught me how that, therefore the supply demand curves for labor don't work because the, the, the demand for the labor of the, of the self-employed is a derived demand. But I think our notions of, the employment, unemployment, the segmentation, productivity, a whole range of concepts really need to be interrogated through the lens of labor markets that are heavily informal. Um, Nancy, I think you know that WeGo has a child care campaign that's focused on largely on the demand side of in women informal workers and their need for child care and an argument for public child care. But there's an equal need to look at the paid care workers in child care centers that are largely hired informally. And I think we need to do more work on that. And finally, on this question of raising wages, you know, so, you know, a lot for a lot of the informal workers, it's not wages, it's earnings. And raising earnings is much more difficult than raising wages. You know, you can, um, and uh, it's, it's the whole development package, if you will, and it's a lot of meso and micro sector policies that impact earnings. Uh, but just to close on social protection, we're very excited that, you know, there is this move for universal social protection, but we're very worried on two counts, right? One is that it takes the employer off the hook, right? And employer and corporations need to be kept in the spotlight for their responsibilities. And the other is that we're doing universal social protection at a time when the big, the big names in the game, if you will, have reduced social protection to cash transfers, right? And that's only one form of social assistance. It's not social security and, it's, and social security is dealing with much more structural issues. And so if we if we move to universal uh, and we have this very narrow um, interpretation, um, we, um, we're in for a problem, a major problem. But I'll close on that. Oh, just to say recovery from below is our mantra of the time. This is the inflection moment. If we don't do recovery from below for the large base of the economy, um, we will have missed the, the moment in this COVID moment. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Mati. But thank you, all of you. You know, this has been such a fascinating discussion. I think everybody has made such important, useful, insightful contributions and the questions and discussion were, were terrific. I certainly have learned a lot. And I, I think what's really interesting is that it's not just a whole range of empirical and policy issues, but all these conceptual issues that have opened up. And I just want to close. I mean, I completely agree. Bob's question, obviously, you know, created a lot of discussion. And I want to emphasize with Marty that I think we have to interrogate many of our notions recognizing the presence of informality, particularly productivity, which we continue to use across, uh, you know, over time and across countries without recognizing that both numerator and denominator are deeply flawed concepts, which don't really capture reality. Whether you're looking at GDP or you're looking at worker, we don't actually capture all of these. And so we have to, go back to the drawing board really in terms of measuring e even e purely economic progress in, in that respect. But this has been a wonderful discussion. I really want to thank all of you for coming and for joining and for making this uh, so insightful. And it started out being about the book, but I think it's gone well beyond that. And it's been uh, very, very useful and interesting. I think it's opened up many new pathways for research. So I hope we can keep this going and we can actually have more such interaction to develop many of these ideas further. Thank you all very much. I'm sorry we couldn't deal with all of the questions, but um, maybe some of them will be, we'll be in touch with you 
individually and respond to some of these. Thank you all very much for joining. Thank you for.